Welcome back everyone to the Python tutorial seminar series. Today, Austin Coots will be covering the Python package NumPy. And I'll hand it over to him in a second, but before we begin, I need to review our code of conduct. Austin, if you could change the slide. There you go. Uh, by joining this Zoom call and participating in this tutorial series, you've agreed to adopt these values and engage in respectful communication only. So if we see any inappropriate remarks in the chat, you will be removed by, uh, by one of the co-hosts. And without further ado, Austin Coots. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about NumPy. And why NumPy? Uh, NumPy is, it's a fundamental building block of a lot of other Python packages. It is a way to access very fast math routines and to store data in compact ways. Um, you'll find NumPy's um, array storage and NumPy's um, uh, linear algebra routines underlying X-Array, Dask, SciPy, Pandas, things in AstroPy, things in Matplotlib, IAPython, a lot of these tools work with NumPy arrays kind of as a default assumed um, data type. And, that, and so NumPy is just a really good fundamental tool to have. It is by no means a tool that you should use everywhere. And we'll, we'll address that later. We'll talk about where NumPy shines and where NumPy is not necessarily super optimal. Um, but the general reason you're going to study NumPy is because it underlies, it's, it's a data type and a package that underlies a lot of what you can do with Python in other places. Um, when to use NumPy, and NumPy's like pros are very compact arrays in memory. Um, they're just allocated bit by bit. Um, so you have, you have an array of, of 10 items, your list of memory is just the exact amount of memory those 10 items contain. Uh, really good for number arrays, numeric arrays, um, it is generally assumed to be a data object type for things like pandas, for things like X-ray or Dask. They kind of assume they're operating on NumPy arrays. Um, NumPy arrays are often stored in memory in either uh, Fortran style or C style, which means that you can use the, the NumPy's built-in LAPAC and BLAST libraries to do very fast linear algebra and matrix manipulation. Uh, NumPy isn't always the correct solution though. NumPy's cons are its array size is inflexible. It, it pre-allocates the chunk of memory that you'll use for the array. And then if you wanna add items or remove items, you are reallocating memory. And you can sometimes be reallocating a lot of memory if you're adding something to a large array. Um, despite being pretty commonly used, it's not supported by every package. So don't try to use it everywhere. And it really doesn't do a whole lot on its own. We will explore its limits uh, in the tutorial today. Um, but it does really generally need other packages before it becomes a useful tool, but it is like an important part of those other packages. So having it as a good fundamental basis will enable a lot of things you can do that are pretty cool later on. Um, I'm gonna keep the introductory introduction short and basically we'll talk about what we'll do today and then I will take some quick questions and then we'll get right into writing code. So uh, we're gonna make this image today, this image, every color is represented by a prime number and it's created from a prime number. We're gonna make it where you're gonna be able to keep a copy um, to be making it on your machine. And if you have any questions before we get started, please, uh, I guess, write them in the chat and Julia will read them to me while I get prepared and get us up to speed on getting our Jupyter Notebook running. Julia, uh, any questions that are coming in? Uh, not yet. Uh, we do have one question that if someone modifies the Google Collab, will they be modifying it for just their own version on their own screen or for everybody? Uh, I believe it's set for view only. Let me check the chair settings. I believe I set it for, yeah, the, the chair settings are view only. So they would have to make a copy before they can modify it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, yep, and I'll hold the rest of the questions until, until the end. Okay. Um, so the first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to open up our terminals. So pick your terminal interface of choice. I am using iTerm2 on a Mac. You're welcome to use terminal or uh, whatever Windows users use. Uh, it's, I've been a while since I've been a Windows user. Um, and you're going to activate your Jupyter environment. So for a lot of you, that's going to be your Jupyter-tutorial environment in Conda. Um, you can list your Conda environments with Conda env list, and that will show you what environments you have available. Um, my Jupyter environment is just labeled Jupyter because I can't be bothered to remember too much. So 
Um, I'm going to kind of activate Jupiter. You will be kind of activating Jupiter tutorial. Um, then you will have your Jupiter environment. And then from there, we need to bring up our Jupiter lab, which will open up a web page. So um, you're just going to type in Jupiter space lab. And that should open up your Jupiter lab. And it should open up a tab in your preferred browser. Um, and it should look something like this. Uh, Austin, could you zoom in on the terminal some more? Even more? Yeah, it's hard for people to see. OK, let me scroll up so you can see what actually I typed in. And I will make the text as big as I can without being unreasonable. Oops. Nope, don't want to do that. I want to hit Alt Q. There we go. So you're going to con to activate your Jupyter environment. And then you're going to type in Jupyter Lab once you are in your Jupyter environment. Um, your Jupyter environment is probably named Jupyter Tutorial. And then you are going to want to create a new notebook in your Jupyter Lab. So once your Jupyter Lab is open, and I think Kevin Paul went over this last two weeks ago, we are going to make a new notebook. Let's name this notebook something relevant. Um, in this case, NumPy tutorial. So you know what it is. And then I'm going to just copy paste. This part you don't have to copy in. I'm just going to make it so that when people look at my screen, um, oh boy, I'm gonna dun -dun. Um, they can see what we're talking about. I think that's most of the 80 characters that were allowed. So there's that. Um, all right, let's start with our imports. So we're just going to get right into it. Uh, Julie, if you see any like super relevant questions pop up in the chat, feel free to read them out loud to me because I'm just going to be monologuing. Um, uh, we have a question about how to open the the new notebook. So you just clicked the the yes. So when you are in this file browser, your first tab is going to have a lot of options of what you can do. You can also click plus here, and that will open your launcher tab. And that launcher tab will have this notebook section. Under that notebook section, just click the Python three thing, and you'll be running your own notebook at that point. Um, it should bring you basically to this page that you see here. Um, where you'll have a, a cell you can type things into. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna do is gonna get import math as M. This is Python's built-in math package. Um, if you're following along with the notebook that I posted online, you'll see the comments on it, but I'm gonna be reading those out pretty much verbatim. Uh, this is Python's built-in math package. It is useful for a lot of things like um, Python's square root function, which is faster than doing number star star uh, 0 0.5, which is Python's exponentiation function. Um, so it, the math package is pretty useful for doing very fast math. We're doing things to a lot of numbers, so we want to have fast math available to us. And then the topic of today's lesson is import NumPy as NP. This is an invocation that you will see a lot. NP is the standard approximation of for NumPy. So a lot of the times when you're pulling people's snippets of code off of the internet, um, they will be using NP as their abbreviation for their NumPy import. It saves you three characters every single time you type it. And trust me, those add up really quickly when you're doing a lot of math. Um, these last few imports are for tautological reasons. Um, but we're going to import matplotlib, um, which is going to allow us to like visualize some data, make sure that we're actually producing what we think we are. Um, oops, not plotlib, that pyplot as plot. Um, and then we're also going to import time so that we can time our functions. We're not going to use the magic functions for timing. Um, I simply don't have them available on my machine. So that's why. Uh, this is that, and that's also Python's built-in timing package. It gives you access to like various system clocks and some other useful features. And this last import um, is so that you can save out your results later. If you do not yet have pill installed in your Conda environment, you can Conda install pillow, and that should get it for you. Pillow is the Conda package for pill, which is the Python image library. You don't have to worry about it. We're not talking about it too much today. We just use it in the very last block. Um, if you want to keep a copy of the 
graphical representation of the colors of prime numbers that we are going to create in today's uh, tutorial. Okay, I talked a lot about how we're going to make this really quick, pretty picture, but how we're going to do that using NumPy is coming up. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start with a prime sieve function. Basically, we want to find all the primes we're going to use eventually to make colors. Now, colors are um, represented by 24 bit, uh, 24 bits, right? You have eight bits of red, eight bits of green, eight bits of blue. So we basically need to find a bunch of 24 bit primes um, so that we can turn those into colors. Now, to do that, we're going to just be very simple, and we're going to use the sieve of some Greek guy's name, Eratosthenes. I can't pronounce Greek. It's my own failing. We're going to use a prime sieve. Um, and we're, so we're going to start with a, a function definition. Um, and we're just going to name it prime sieve. Uh, and then we're going to provide an argument that goes into this function of the maximum number we want to look for primes underneath. So like if we're looking for primes that are 24 bits long, we just need to look for any prime less than 2 to the 24. And boom, we have a list of 24 bit primes. Um, so we are going to do some sort of, we're, well, first we're going to do an offset. So we're going to be starting our list of prime numbers at 2, basically, or at 1. And um, having an offset will allow us to just use this offset later on rather than having to specify um, our array element offset every single time by row. That means if we need to change our offset or modify the way we're doing things, we can do it easily later. Um, it also makes the um, description of what we're doing when you actually read the line of like we're modifying an element in an array, it makes that like in plain English rather than like plain English plus some arbitrary magic constant. Um, so we're just going to a sort of sidestep that whole lack of clarity there. Um, this is our first use of NumPy right here. We are going to make ourselves a linearly spaced array of numbers using NumPy's linspace um, function. And what linspace does is you provide a start point, uh, you provide an end point, and you provide the number of elements you want to have in it. Now, in our case, oh boy, I'm going to need to minimize this left side here. So in our case, um, we have, we're starting from one because we're, count, we're basically making a list of real numbers up to two to up to max number in length. We want to have our last number be max number. And we want to have the number of numbers be the same as max number. Basically, if we count from one to 10 um, and we have 10 elements, it's going to be sp evenly spaced integers. Um, we can also supply, in most NumPy functions, you can supply the data type. So for us, because we only, we're interested in integers, uh, we're going to supply d type is equal to int. Now we're using Python's built-in integer um, rather than the NumPy integer class because of some changes that came along in the most recent version of NumPy 1.20. Um, but the, NumPy's int just is a transparent wrapper over Python's built-in int type. So it doesn't really matter. Um, and now we're going to start building our sieve. Now, this is the first time a lot of you might see list comprehension in NumPy, sorry, in uh, Python. So we're going to do some list comprehension to extract number from numbers. So we're going to do for number in numbers. Um, but part of our list comprehension that we're going to do here is we're actually going to slice the uh, array like this. Now, this means that we're starting at element one and continuing to the end. So when you see this here, this is element one. And then this basically says, the second one says everything after one where we want. Um, keep in mind, NumPy arrays are zero indexed. So that means that if I was to go this from, from the zeroth element to the end, you get the entire list of numbers. If I go this to the end, I get every element starting from the second element in that list. Um, you'll run into this one versus zero indexing argument a lot. And actually, we're going to do some negative indexing later. So you'll see where that gets really wonky sometimes and really interesting in others. But this allows us to skip the number one in our list of prime numbers because we don't want to remove every number uh, in the list. So we have to start at number two, not at number one. Um, 
And then we're going to do a conditional Boolean statement. We're going to say if the number, if not number equals equals zero. I'm going to make that spaced out prettily. Okay, so why are we doing this? Well, the way the sieve works is that we pick the first number that isn't zero, and then we just increment along that array um, by the value of the number we saw. So if we say find the number two, we then take every second element after two and set it to zero uh, and remove it because it's clearly not prime because it's a multiple of two. We do the same thing when we come across three, we take every third element after three and set that to zero. And so if a number isn't zero and we've come across it in our array, we know for a fact that it is prime because it hasn't been eliminated yet as a multiple of a smaller prime. Um, we're using if not rather than uh, not equals to for clarity. Um, so we're saying if not numbers equal zero, you could also do like uh, something to the effect of, hang on, why am I not typing? Uh, we could also do something like if, you know, number not, oops, not equal to zero, but like that's not as clear as, you know, if not number equal to equals. Um, and it, it's the same under the hood, so it doesn't matter. Um, and then we are going to say for whole in range. So you'll often see range used in um, for loops to the point where some people actually think that it's part of the for loop structure of Python. It's not, but it is so frequently used because it is so useful that range works a lot like lin space. Um, so what we're doing here is we're saying for hold in range, uh, max number, so start, start number, you know, end number, and then number. What we are doing is we are creating this uh, array kind of like just like a lens based array that is temporary and we are going to whoops I did not mean to hit enter um, and is used for removing the elements we don't want. So we are now going to index numbers, which is our list of, of real numbers of the number plus the offset. Um, we're just going to set that equal to zero every time we come across a multiple of our number and there we are that is the entire sieve um, that we are going to build. Now you'll notice in the very first element here, I talk about how I'm going to describe end of context using the pass uh, command. This is a no op in Python. And what this allows us to do is allows me to like be very clear um, about leaving context. Yes, the indents work and stuff, but I come from a more, I'm not gonna say classical background. I, mean, I come from a Java background. So I like having a very clear delineator of when I am leaving the scope. Um, and in terms of like, describing what we are doing with, um, oh, I should probably get back on topic. So what we are going to have to return some value from our, our definition here. So we need to return something. Now we have this list of numbers where a lot of things have been set to zero and everything that isn't set to zero is prime. Um, and we can do something really cool with, with NumPy arrays is we can index with a Boolean argument which means that I can basically say, I only want it to return the numbers where numbers is greater than zero. So if you have an element in this array that is greater than zero, I want you to extract it, put it in a new NumPy array for me and return it. And I don't have to do more than just this to get a Boolean indexed array output that is compact and is ready to use. Um, and from there, I can shift enter. Well, I guess I shouldn't because I haven't actually shift entered any of this to actually run them. There we go. Um, here we go. So now we are going to actually run our prime sieve and extract our primes. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a start time. So Time.perf counter pulls the uh, floating point seconds from the clock with the highest available resolution on your computer, or at least the highest available resolution that the, your Python system is aware of. Um, and that will give you basically a, a, a comparable time that you can compare your end time against. It will not give you an absolute time. It will just give you a relative time. So you always have to compare end versus start to get your actual elapsed time. Um, and then we're going to make ourselves a primes list by basically calling our prime sieve. 
and we're going to call it with the max number of two to the 24. Uh, star star is the Python equivalent of the upper caret or the exponentiation time, uh, exponentiation sign. Um, you could do math.pow. This is an equivalent command would be m dot pow of two and 24. That would raise two to the 24th power. It is the same command. Um, but in this case, there's no speed to benefit to doing the math.pow command. And if you're using Python a lot, the star star in um, uh, star star is clear enough for most use. Uh, we're going to create an end time again with perf counter. Uh, come on. Perf, per. Okay, so I can't type, but that is not your fault. Um, and then actually, before we do anything else, we should probably put in some print statements. So we probably want to print the, uh, the total time it took. Um, but we can just do that two floating point numbers in a print statement, easy, easy enough to do. And then we should probably make sure that we're actually getting data out of our, um, of our call. So we're going to have like a quick visualization of, you know, after it takes however long to run, let's just uh, have it output a little picture showing a list, like showing a graph of our prime numbers. We should expect it to start lower left corner head up the upper right corner and give us a list of things. Um, on my machine, this should take about 13 and a half seconds to run. We'll see if that's actually true. And if there's any questions, Julie, we've got ugh, half a minute for you to ask them if there's anything relevant right now. And if I'm going too fast, say so in the chat and I can slow down. But I don't want to out type anybody. I want everyone to be able to you know, keep up. Uh, can you summarize what the uh, prime C function does again for everyone? Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe sure. a string. Okay, so uh, the prime C function starts with a list of real numbers, positive real numbers. And for every positive real number other than one, um, it will go and Basically, you're not you're not doing trial division. You're just arbitrarily setting things to zero if they are n times that number away from that number. So let's say I come across the number two, which is the first number I come across. It's not one. I will then set four, six, eight, ten, twelve, etc., all to zero. I just remove them by by replacing twelve with zero. I replace fourteen with zero. I replace sixteen with zero. I just get rid of them and I zero them all out. Well, then I come across three and I set six, which is already zero to zero. I set nine to zero. I set 15 to zero all the way down the list um, until you've hit the end of your list. And then you come back and say, okay, the next well, then four where four was is now a zero. And I come across five and then I do every fifth element get set to zero. And that's very strange and not what I expected. Did I type something in wrong? Lin space max number. Um, that is an unexpected result. Give me one moment while I evaluate the efficacy of my program. I'm showing the wrong number of primes because I am showing that like my early primes are missing. What did I do wrong? Oh, okay. So here's what I did wrong. Um, you'll notice that in section four, I have this, this hole for my seed. And I mistyped my index for what I'm removing. I want to remove all of the holes that I have created. I do not want to remove all of my numbers. So we are going to rerun this with shift enter, and then we are going to rerun this. And then it should only take 13 and a half seconds, and it should provide an accurate list of prime numbers. That is my bad. Everyone go back and make sure that this line has been modified to be hole plus offset not numbers plus offset or number plus offset. And then it should run in a reasonable amount of time, not 90 seconds, but 10 seconds. And you should get this nice linear list of prime numbers. This is why we visualize our data early and often, um, because I would have gone on with this broken list of primes all the way to the end, not realizing it was broken until you know we tried to make an image out of it. Uh, but this way, I can immediately tell that there was something wrong with my data and 
now all of you have a function program, which is good news for everyone. Um, I think I've explained the sieve again. Hopefully that time made more sense. Um, but we're time marches on and waits for no humans. So here we go. We are going to do. OK, so we have a list of prime numbers now. We have over a million primes numbers. In fact, if I were to um, print the length of our prime number list, uh, if I can type, if I were to print the length of our prime number list, we would see that we have 1,077,872 primes, um, which is a lot of prime numbers. And that's the number of pixels we'll have in our final image. But first we have to figure out what shape can we make an image where we can contain all of our values without having to have unneeded black space. We don't want an image that only is half colored. We don't want to have that. We want to have an image that is all bright and vibrant. So we're going to need to do an integer factorization of the length of our list of prime numbers. So for that, we need to write an integer factoriz factorization method. And for that, we are going to use the trial division method. And we are not going to use NumPy because I'm going to show you an example of when NumPy is not the correct choice of tools to use. So we're going to create a function called factors. And we are going to basically say, I'm going to want to request the factors of a given arbitrary number. And we are going to create a limit. Now this is, so every pair of factors is gonna have one of its two factors be smaller than the square root of the number you are factoring. Um, if you need an explanation as to why, see me after class, I'd be more than happy to explain it, but I don't think it really fits the scope of this part of what we're talking about. So I'm just gonna type this in. Um, so our limit is gonna be an integer, which is basically we're taking the floor of the square root, which is fine. Um, Cause if the square root is not, is a floating point value, then well, we know for a fact that <laughs> the integer square root of it is still gonna be the correct one that we need to worry about. Um, when we're gonna create a Python list. Now this is not a NumPy array. This is a uh, factor, is a list. It is a Python native list. And it's defined by doing that. Two square brackets. Um, so you'll see these square brackets a lot. They are very versatile. They are used a lot in Python. They mean different things in different contexts. Do not let that scare you. Um, usually context is extraordinarily clear. Uh, in this case, this factor says these are the ends of our list. Our list is starts and ends and is empty. Um, we are going to do a for loop and we're basically going to iterate for our smaller of our two factors or F1, we're gonna call F1 our small factor and F2 our larger factor. Um, I, I would normally not teach using non-descriptive uh, variable names, but we're gonna type F1 a lot and I just, I can't be bothered. <laughs> so this is again a four in range. Again, range is very commonly used. Um, we're starting at the number two, we're going to limits and we are incrementing by one. Um, And then we are going to do a conditional check. Now this conditional check is a condi conditional check against zero using the remainder function. So there's two ways we could do this. Um, but the correct way of what we're doing is we're basically doing a modulo operation and looking at the remainder. And if that remainder is zero, um, we are going to assume that, the, that our F1 is a factor of our uh, number. So we're going to use our math package and we use the math re remainder function. And we're going to put in our number, which is the user provided value. And we are going to provide the factor that we're iterating across. And then if the remainder of our number divided by our factor is zero, we know we have a factor, a small factor. Um, and then we can just immediately calculate our F2, our larger of our two factors. Um, and that'll be an integer value. It will be number um, divided by F1. Now, there is a thing we could do here that works great in Python 3, but isn't super clear, um, where we can do something called integer division. So this here, number divided by whatever, will always return a floating point in Python 3. We could do something to the effect of number slash slash 2, and, or slash slash f1, and that returns an integer value where there is no floating 
point after the division. Um, it's going to be useful for us later when we're casting to a color, but it's not the right choice for us right now. Um, because it's not immediately clear what you're doing, and unless you're doing evil bit hacking, you should try to keep your code self-documenting and call it saying, I'm taking the integer value of this division is a lot more clear than saying number slash slash F1 um, if anyone's trying to read your code later on. Uh, we're not playing code golf, so we're not worried about the number of keystrokes too much. Um, so one cool thing that Python uh, lists can do is they have a very fast append command where we can just append a list of elements or a list of a list of elements. In this case, this is a nested list that we're creating. So it'll be two dimensions. And we can just add that in because a Python list is pointer based. So it just creates a, adds a pointer to this original list pointing to this data structure, which itself is a list pointing with a pointer to here and a pointer to here, a pointer to F1 and a pointer to F2. And you don't really have to worry too much about everything else. Um, and then we're going to we'll start leaving these scopes because that is our entire factorization uh, algorithm. Now here, we are going to return our factors. So this is where we can go. Let's say um, we want to return a NumPy array and we want to return the list of factors. So we do that and that will this NumPy array function creates a NumPy array object, populates it with the um, items and dimensions of factor lists, assuming factor list is capable of being cast into a NumPy array. Um, in our case, it will be. And so we don't really have to worry about the rest. And then we're going to pass to exit the function scope. And then our function is defined, hit shift enter to load that into memory. And we will go ahead and call it. Now this function runs fast enough that we're not gonna time it. Um, we are going to make uh, factor result is equal to factors of the length of our primes. So what len primes does here, this len primes returns the length of the primes um, array that we have created. This factors is the depth of the function we've just defined, and that will return um, a NumPy array containing our factor results. Um, now we've got some print statements to like explain some things. So we're just going to start writing these in. Uh, Kevin, I believe, or you have learned F strings in the past, so I'm just going to use those right away. Um, Don't be helpful. I, when it does paired quotations, it's trying to be helpful, but it always drives me batty. Uh, shift enter is not the correct response. Print F. Uh, the rest of you can just feel free to like copy paste um, from the notebook that's published online into your thing. You don't need to actually write all this out. I just want to make sure that I'm allowing people to write it out with me if they want to, so as not to go too fast or do anything wonky. Um, so actually, here is where we're going to use our first reverse index or negative indexing. Um, what we can do is we can, if we want to pull out the most square image resolution from our factor results, um, and what's with factor result, not results. Um, we can index from the end and go backwards. So if you imagine your array as like a list of numbers from left to right, generally you count from left to right, but you can go with a minus sign to index from the right to the left, which is really useful, um, extraordinarily useful in fact, because it allows you to like immediately pull the last element of a list without having to worry about like figuring out how long the list is first. Um, and it's, it's just incredibly useful and handy to have. And we're actually going to use it again in this next one. Um, well, let's take a look at what we've got so far. We have a list of potential image resolutions where we have basically all of these pairs of numbers could be our, the dimensions of our image. 
Um, the most square image we can create is 808 pixels by 1,334 pixels, which sounds pretty good to me. That's pretty close to the resolution of most computer screens. So it could make a cool uh, wallpaper or whatever. But let's see if it's actually going to look any good. So we're going we're gonna to have two more print statements. First, we're going to print, like, what is the ratio of that image? Is it, like, super narrow or is it, like, pretty square? It looks pretty square to me, but, like, you know, let's do some math and double check. Um, and for that, we're going to do some complex negative indexing just for fun. Um, we're going to factor result. And then we're going to negative index on the first axis of that 2D array. And then we are going to negative index on the second axis of that 2D array. And then we are going to divide that. Uh, yeah, 1, 1 over 1, 2. Um, we're going to divide that element that we have just individually addressed in this two-dimensional NumPy array. And we are going to then factor result minus 1 minus 2. Um, we are then going to divide it by the other one in that same pair. And we are going to print that as our like actual image ratio, which is 1.16. That rings a bell for me. That sounds pretty close to like what the golden ratio is. So just for fun, we're going to print out what the golden ratio would be and see how close we are to having actually like honest to goodness pretty image, uh, at least in terms of like, if you want to put it in a museum and claim that it has some merit, you would have to talk about the golden ratio because that's how art works. Um, we can just basically drop the uh, golden ratio in here, which is one plus, um, we're going to use the math square root function again, um, which is faster than doing the square root, not with the math function. Um, it's just, this is the uh, closed form of the uh, continued fraction that creates the golden ratio. There we go. So the golden ratio is 1.61, we have 1.65, so our image is going to look pretty fly. And that's the technical term. Uh, you can feel free to quote me on that. Okay, so now we have a pretty good plan of what we're going to do. We have our image contents in terms of our primes array. We have a pretty good idea of the shape of the image that we need to create. Um, but we're kind of missing this point of like, well, we still need to reshape our data into something that's rectangular and not just like a list. We also need to turn all of our integers into colors, right? Because right now all we have is a list of integers. We don't actually have anything that can represent color data without more manipulation being done to it. So let's start with array reshaping. Um, so we're just gonna start off and say, our height of our image is going to be, uh, I should probably put in my comment here so everyone knows what section we're on. So I'll do that with a copy paste. You do not need to have that in yours. We're going to start off with height, um, and that's going to be equal to And now here, here I am breaking some rules. I am negative indexing and I am positive indexing at the same time you'll notice that negative indexing is always minus one or less um, because minus zero does not actually pull the end of your array. Um, it's weird, it's true, it's how it works. Don't worry about it. Um, so when you're, when you're negative indexing, you're indexing from negative one to negative n. When you are positive indexing, you are indexing from zero to n minus one. Um, enjoy that fact that you can bring out at parties and immediately be considered the least cool person in the room. <laughs> Not that I would have personal experience with that. Um, let's see. And then we're going to minus one here. And then our width is also um, going to be positive index. So now this is the part of the lecture where I have strong opinions that I will try to be diplomatic about. So we are going to first um, extract a shaped array from our list of primes. So we're going to reshape primes using the NumPy's built-in reshape. Um, I would call this a method if it were actually a method. 
Um, reshape is a function that takes in a NumPy array that it is assigned to, like this, and you provide a shape tuple, which is basically a list that is defined by curvy, brace, curvy brackets rather than square brackets, so parentheses rather than brackets. Um, we're going to put in height and width because that's what we're dealing with. Um, but it does not reshape the, the, so it does not reshape primes. It returns a reshaped array, but it does not reshape the object that it's attached to, which is why it is not a method and is instead a function. And why it always causes me to mess things up because I come from a background where that is not the assumed behavior. And I, we're, gonna, we're gonna demonstrate that real quick by this. You can call shape on an umpire array and that will return the tuple of its shape. Oh my goodness, stop being helpful. Um, and we can do that again, just for the other half of this thing. Um, you will notice by the time we have finished typing this line, that shape no longer feels like a real word. Um, that's just a side effect of working with, <laughs> with certain things. Uh, it happens to me way too frequently for it to, to feel natural. Okay, why are you complaining? Primes. So you'll notice that despite we, we call reshape on prime on the primes object, which is the primes numpy array, it does not reshape the primes numpy array and, and extend in exchange, it returns the prime shape one that we saved off here. Um, it's just a, it's, if you've used a lot of object oriented programming and are coming to Python from a Java or C background, this will violate your expectations. Um, but if you are new to programming in general and Python is your first language, this will feel pretty natural that you just always assign a label to a result from a function call. Um, it's just, it's, it's, some people find this really easy. Some people find this really hard. I'm somewhere in the middle on that. Okay, so we have reshaped our data. We now have a rectangular array of data that we can then use to make an image. So how do we turn integers into pixels? Um, oh boy, I am running out of, out of time. So we're just gonna truck right along. We are going to take the NumPy array and turn it into an image. And to do that, we are going to create a function definition just as we always have um, image from array. And then we are going to pass in an array and we are going to create an image. So I tried this a couple of different ways and it turns out that pre-allocating a three-dimensional NumPy array and then modifying elements is not natively faster than just doing it with lists. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do it with lists. Um, so NumPy arrays have this to list function that returns the NumPy arrays contents as an appropriately dimensioned Python native list. We've already defined height earlier on here under the array reshaping, so we can just use that in our inside of our function. Um, not super object oriented, but like totally fine for what we're doing today um, in range H-E-I-G-H-T. Um, so you do not actually have to supply a start, end, and incrementer for the range function. Um, it, you only have to do that if you're not starting at zero and if you're not ending at um, the, val uh, the value minus one. But in our case, we are doing this the most Pythonic way possible. So we can just basically be lazy, which is kind of nice for you know, my, my core fingertips. Um, there we go. And then we are going to extract our values. So ARGB. So we know um, the actual integer is 32 bits long, generally represented as the alpha channel, the red channel, green channel, blue channel. Alpha channel is transparency. Um, and the red, green, and blue are self-explanatory. Self um, here we are going to do some pixel bashing or some bit bashing. Um, we're going to take our ARGB value. We are going to, we talked about this just a few minutes ago. Um, we are going to do a integer division because I don't want to have to do like math.floor of this value. Um, so we're basically just doing some funky math to extract um, our 
values without having to do like a bit mask or something that's even harder to understand. Um, not that this is also particularly clear. Uh, I'll have to just ask you to trust me on this one. Um, you'll kind of see what we're doing. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to drop this comment here from my notes straight in here and save myself some typing, but you can read it along with my screen. We're doing floor division here, multiplication. Oops. We're doing multiplication here. We are doing a remainder function here, and then we are doing normal floating point division. So we're doing both types of division and a multiplication and a um, built-in remainder function, all kind of with these single arguments. Now, it's not very readable, which is why earlier on I used math.remainder, but this is a legit way to do the math. Um, for what we are trying to accomplish. That's our green channel and our blue channel is going to be even more simple. There we go. And then we're going to do something cool with our list. So right now we have a two dimensional list of image that is indexed by Y and then by X with our two for loops. What we can do is we can take that element and we can actually replace that individual element on our list with another list of our values. And so a list can be uh, <laughs> I was gonna say multidimensional, but that's not the right word. A list can have a mix of dimensionality to it. You can have a list that's like partially five dimensional and you can have the remainder of that list be like two dimensional or one dimensional. Um, this, so, cause it's just nested data structures. So what we're doing here is we're just gonna like replace for every element, we're gonna replace each element with an actual another dimension containing three values. Um, and then that is the end of our scope. So we're gonna use pass to exit our scopes. And then we are going to return this as a NumPy array and then end the scope of our definition and store that into memory. And now we are going to see how long it takes to run. So we're going to again use a start value from our time, our Python time perf counter. And then we are going to call the function. So we're gonna we're gonna create this this array called image one. So we are going to do other things to it, but for now we're gonna call it image one. We are going to call the function that we defined as image from array, and we are going to pass in our primes shape array, our, our reshaped primes array, um, and then we will create an end time from our time performance counter. And we will print the elapsed time. And then we will use plot. So this is matplotlibs.pyplot. And we can use mshow to get a not pixel perfect, but like a basic you know, did we actually get anything usable? Again, this is like the, let's just do this real quick and see what happens kind of thing. Um, and it took two seconds to run and we can see that we're making progress on this image. Now with 10 minutes remaining, I'm going to quickly give you guys the, the code you need to um, save the image on your local machines. And then we will get into answering questions. Um, so to make an image we can say we're going to use that pillow import that I talked about at the very beginning of the, of the tutorial. And we are just basically going to make an image two array where we're going to use numpy's array function again. Um, and in this case, we're going to take image one. We're going to multiply it by 256 because image one is scaled from zero to one per color channel. We want to have this set to like actual integers. Um, but they need to be of D type. And this is the first time we're actually going to use a NumPy data type. We are going to use the NumPy uint uint8 data type. Um, 
which is what the pillow or the Python image library expects to have um, from uh, to, to make an image with. Uh, image three is going to be a modification of image two. We're going to make an image object, which we imported image from Python image library. Uh, we're going to use the from array uh, method or the from array function. And we are going to pass in the image two data, which is now in the correct format for uh, PIL. Oops. And we probably want to. Oh, why did my email pop up? I'm sorry, everyone. Now you're seeing potentially sensitive information. Um, <laughs> let's hope that that didn't get looked at by hundreds of people on a live broadcast. We're going to show that image. And here we are. So this is the image we can create. Now, if we wanted to save that image um, out, we would then do image 3.save. We would want to save it as something like primes.png. And we would want to compress it. This is a list of prime numbers. So it's going to be not very compressible, but it will have some compressible elements to it. Um, so we want to compress uh, it as much as possible. So we're going to use compress level 9 on the image 3 save function. And then from there, we do that. It produces the image. And we can see, assuming it worked correctly, somewhere it put down this uh, primes.png value. I don't know where it actually put it. It should have put it. Oh, here it is. So now you can see prime PMG has appeared in our, um, our folder. So if you have done all of these steps, you now have your very own copy of this primes image. And I have eight minutes to take questions. So let's do that. I probably don't, I, I will keep sharing my screen so you can get these last few things in. Um, Julia, would you please read questions? Because I still can't see the chat. Uh, yes, uh, so I'm gonna scroll through and maybe pull up some, some from earlier on first. So can you remind everyone about uh, pass and the difference between pass, break and continue and some other uh, commands okay. that we've seen? Okay, so, so pass is a, what's, it's known as a no op or no operation command. It does absolutely nothing except take up space on your screen. Um, I like it in that it is an explicit way that is not white space of like showing where an out dent is rather than an indent. Um, and it's useful for a thing like a tutorial. I do not use them in my day-to-day -day coding. Um, I just like to have them when I am showing code to someone else. Uh, a break statement breaks a loop completely. Um, so if you cut if in a for loop you have a conditional statement that wants to like prevent you from running past the end of an array or has detected an error or something in your data, you can have a a break statement that will break the outer for loop. Um, in some languages you can break to a label, but I think in Python it just breaks the, the, the closest loop. What continue does is similar to break, but more nuanced. Continue breaks that particular run of the loop and goes back to as though you were starting the next run. So let's say I want to skip doing math to something if I detect that it's like not good data. If I'm going through my list of data with, an, with a for loop uh, using list comprehension and I come across something that's like np.nan. Well, I don't want to do division and scaling and stuff to np.nan. So I will put in a if you know the value is np.nan, then just continue which means that like go to the next number of the list and continue the for loop, but don't finish doing this particular iteration of the loop. Um, in Groundhog Day, when um, he drives the groundhog and himself over the cliff into a, into a quarry, that's him hitting continue and not breaking the loop. Because uh, he just wakes up the next morning ready to go again. Um, break actually is like when you exit the loop entirely. And I don't think that there are many other loop control commands in Python. Thank you, Austin. Uh, could you uh, do a little breakdown of the difference between np dot uh, arrange and np dot lin space and what their different arguments are? Oh boy. Um, I actually don't think I've used np dot arrange uh, in anger in my life. Uh, I've always used lin space. Uh, let me Google it real quick and I can have an answer, but I'll, I'll, come, I'll circle back to this. Uh, uh, ask me another question. I, I can maybe uh, answer that then. Okay. So, um, np.a range is great when you have a 
set step size you would like to use. So the arguments are start, stop, and step, where np.lin space is better when you have a set number of, of um, elements you would like to have. So it creates a, it subdivides the difference between your start and stop by the number of steps instead of defining it by the step size. Okay, so numpy dot arrange is very similar to the the Python built in range function in that you're defining start, stop, and step size. Mm -hmm. like but it is by a, creating a numpy array instead of a list. Awesome. Cool. Which um, also could you kind of summarize the difference between a list and a numpy array? Okay, so a list is a pointer based data structure that is very easily to, easy to modify and picks up and is not continuous in memory. Um, a NumPy array is harder to modify and takes up continuous memory. A NumPy array is very fast to index. A, num, a Python list is slower to index. Um, they are different in that if you had a deck of cards um, and you had basically cards stored all over the house and then you had like a little ledger that told you where all the cards were, that would be a Python list. Um, you could add elements to that ledger pretty easily. You could rearrange it pretty easily because it's just a little piece of paper. A NumPy array is a deck of is the deck of cards in your hand. It's way more compact, um, but like adding in a card is just like replace the deck. Um, they are very different. That it's easier to talk about the differences than their similarities. To be honest, there there's more things different about them than there is similar to them. They are both useful for what they are useful for, which farmer statement, but sure. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we had some questions about uh, list indexing with the nested lists or nested arrays rather. Mm -hmm. And um, a refresher of like the, the Boolean. So what does double equals mean versus the regular equal sign? Okay, so let's start with the Boolean talk because that's actually pretty fundamental. So a, a straight equals that you see here, which is one equal sign, that is an assignment operator. That says, I want you to take whatever is to the right of that equal sign, and I want you to put a little sticky note on it with the name that's on the left of the equal sign so that we know what it is and we keep it around and we won't garbage collect it or get rid of it. Um, what double equals does is that says, I am showing you two objects. Please tell me if they are the same. Now, in Python, because it's a pretty high level language, double equals works differently on different types of objects. But in general, you can assume that it will say, you know, is the underlying value of these two integer objects the same? Is the contents of these two string objects the same? It's a comparator and it tells you true or false, are they the same? Um, not to be confused with are they identical because we're not gonna get into like object identification, but like it will tell you if they're the same or equivalent. Um, an equal sign assigns a value. Two equal signs tells you if the two values are equal to each other. What was the other part of that question? Something about uh, indexing. Um, so about indexing multidimensional arrays or multidimensional lists. Um, so you index on like row to column, right? So you index by Y, then you index by X. Um, so if you had a three-dimensional array, you would index by dimension three, then dimension two, then dimension one, counting down, generally speaking, from left to right. Mm -hmm. uh, what data types can a NumPy array hold? A, a NumPy array can hold any data type of equivalent size. So a NumPy array, to my knowledge, cannot hold um, varying length strings. But if you have a bunch of strings that are all the same length, you're good. Um, NumPy arrays can hold any NumPy native data types like uints, floats, doubles, longs, quads, anything that you can find in the NumPy dot whatever uh, data types list. Um, I can give you an outside reference for all of the lists of available data types. There's quite a few of them. Um, can be held in a NumPy array. Basically, a NumPy array says, you know, there's 100 elements in my array. Each element of my array takes n number of bits. So my array volume is n times number of elements of bits long in memory. Um, yeah. 
Okay, I think that's uh, all the questions. If anyone has any other questions or I missed one, please uh, put it in the chat now. And uh, also please share your uh, virtual applause for Austin for his coverage of NumPy. Uh, we have a question, how do we interpret the image? So looking at this cool wood grain uh, that we've produced, okay. uh, what do we kind of get out of looking at that? Okay, so um, you'll notice kind of three different aspects of this image. If you zoom all the way in, you'll see these like kind of clownfish wiggly blue lines that look like the stripes of a clownfish that go left to right. Um, those are your blue channel rolling over because your blue channel is your trailing bits, the ones that, that, that will roll over the fastest in a modulo kind of way. So you get these kinds of like left to right blue waves. And then the wood grain that you're seeing, that is the green channel rolling over. So that it'll ramp up to a bright green and then it'll drop to no green. And then it'll ramp up to a bright green and drop to no green. That gives you that sharp kind of wood grain edge. And then from the very top of the image, all the way down to the bottom, you're gradually increasing your red channel, which does not roll over. Your red channel just goes from no red at the very top of the image to all of the red at the bottom of the image. Um, that's how you can interpret it, because it's basically you're taking this, these, these linearly increasing numbers, and you're looking at the modulo of the bottom eight bits, the modulo of the middle eight bits, and the modulo of the top eight bits as this number increases in, in value. Uh, so Austin, uh, before we leave, could you give a summary of the concepts that were the learning objectives from this tutorial? So maybe list the key functions that we looked okay. at and, and data types. The important fun the, the, the key concepts would be, how do you make a NumPy array? Like when you want to generate a new NumPy array, you would use um, a range or, or then space or zeros or ones to create your your data. Um, you can use numpy.array to import existing data. You can use as array to import a different numpy array into your array. Um, so one of the key features is like learning how to get your data into the numpy array format. And then from there, I would say, Array manipulation, reshaping things, rotating your arrays, those are key features of NumPy. Uh, modifying your data set without, like, not changing your data itself, but like modifying the presentation of your data set, taking that long list of primes and turning it into a rectangle of primes that can be turned into an image. That kind of array manipulation is an important part of what NumPy can do and do well and do quickly. And then the last thing would be getting that data back out of NumPy. Um, we do that with when we're trying to make the image into a, well, take those numbers and turn them into uh, pixel values. We are actually using the NumPy's to list function to turn that NumPy array back into a Python native data structure. Um, because I said, there are packages that do math and science that might not use NumPy for everything. And so getting the data back out of NumPy is an important thing to know. Um, we did not touch on doing linear algebra or um, too much like really matrixy things like changing things into like upper or triangular or whatever um, simply because I didn't want to make this about linear algebra I wanted to make it something like you would use NumPy to do interesting cool things and we get exposed to it in a way that's like shows you what it can do without being like dry boring and scary um, so hopefully that came across and I didn't monologue too brutally. Uh, you can use NumPy for linear algebra. Linear algebra, sorry, uh, linear algebra is built into NumPy. Um, you can look at numpy.linalg. If you just want to Google search numpy.linalg, you'll find the linear algebra library uh, that NumPy uses. Uh, NumPy uses uh, LaPack and Blast, which are Fortran packages on the back end. They import those Fortran packages um, through NumPy's built-in f to pi compiler package which is something I can go on for hours about. <laughs> um, but yeah, NumPy does have a lot of built-in linear algebra things. If there's something that's not built into NumPy that you want to use for linear algebra, I bet you someone's already written it. You can look around on Conda or search Stack Overflow for that. Now, yeah, SciPy is also really good. SciPy has got some great like, like minimize functions. Like if you actually want to optimize something, SciPy minimize, it's right there. It's, it's great, it's fantastic.
Thank you, Austin. Yeah, thank you everyone. everyone for attending. Yeah, thank you everyone. Um, see you guys, you people in, uh, Julia knows when the next one is. I haven't yeah, okay. been mentioned. So, uh, <laughs> two weeks, uh, we will be covering Matplotlib. Let me pull up the calendar so I don't misspeak on the date. That will be on March 24th at 1 p.m. Mountain Time. And we'll send out more information uh, about how to prepare for that and how to join that call. Thank you.